Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, our next uh, edition of our Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an economic specialist with NDSU Extension. I uh, want to thank you again for joining us and, and we'll go ahead and just uh, hop right in. Uh, just a few notes as we move forward. Uh, we will help you with this if you forget, but please have your microphone and camera off. Uh, and then use chat for questions. So if you have any questions uh, as we go, feel free to, to write them in as they come to you. Uh, and we'll make sure that we work through all of them uh, uh, as we move to that, that Q&A period. Uh, so again, use the, use the chat. Uh, and when you're done, if you'd be uh, willing to, we have a few questions we'd like for you to answer, uh, including what else you might wanna hear about in future editions of, of this webinar series. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Parman, who's our egg finance specialist. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So uh, we're back again. I believe this is our fifth one. And uh, I'm going to cover some macro stuff here, uh, which kind of dictates what's going on with the economy, talking a little bit about uh, something what's going on in the financial institutions and credit and uh, finishing up with a little bit of policy. So the last four weeks, uh, in terms of new unemployment filings has been the worst ever. In fact, uh, it's, we've, we've managed to increase unemployment uh, to levels that it took the financial crisis literally uh, months and almost a year to accomplish and they didn't even reach the levels that are being seen today. Uh, yesterday's report came out at 5.24 million, which is less than the week ending March 28th or April 4th, but still looking at it historically is still just astronomically high. We've, uh, it, on the next slide, I actually have the numbers broken down, you can see. So March 21st, we had 3.28 million. Uh, March 28th, which was the high so far at about 6.9. Then April 4th at 6.6. .6, and then April 11th at 5.25 million. Now, if you take a labor uh, participation force of 164.5 million, some, some, some say 162, some say 164, and you add those numbers to the 5.8 million that were already unemployed at the time, that gives us about a 16.5% unemployment rate, up from 3.5. Now, if you look, going back to looking at it historically, the height of the financial crisis, we almost hit 10%, 9.9. And then 1982 was the last time we were over 10% at almost 11. And then of course the depression, the height of the depression in 33 was 25. The difference between today, uh, again, I'll say this, the difference between right now and those periods was those were very long-term in terms of months and years, uh, very long-term periods of high unemployment that lasted quite a long time, as I said, many years. Right now we were, we're at 16 and a half percent or so and we've done it in a matter of about a month. So this is, uh, this is pretty unprecedented, the level that we're achieving. And of course, the big question going to, is going to be uh, how fast and if a lot of these jobs are gonna return. You hear things coming out of the press that say one in five of these businesses will never return and s some say even higher. That remains to be seen. Uh, and and uh, Ron's gonna talk a little bit about the the small business loans that are a program that's been put in place to try to help mitigate that sum. But that's really the big question is how many of these businesses are going to return and how many of these jobs are going to return? Because if not, we could be looking at long, longer term unemployment, a whole lot higher than that three and a half percent we were at before we uh, got uh, wound up in this mess. So the next slide shows some of what's being go what's going on. And this is uh, a topic that's picking up traction this week, and that's credit tightening. Uh, for instance, J.P. Morgan Chase has increased or tightened their requirement for a new home loan. You have to have a credit score of above 700 and you have to be able to put 20% down. Otherwise, it's pretty much a non-starter on a conventional loan. And across the country, the amount of conventional loans has dropped almost 25 dropped almost 25% in March. We don't have April's data yet, but I expect it's going to be a whole lot worse. Jumbo loans dropping you know, almost 37% and then government like VH, uh, uh, VA, FHA and USDA loans falling almost 7%. And I would expect that those are gonna fall even further into April. So remember this is backward looking and this hit about mid-March. Uh, April is going to be a, probably a full month of, of this and, and, and the fallout from it. So I expect that that's going to be 
uh, much worse. So then if you look at the next slide, I have a chart uh, showing mortgage credit availability index. It's just an index of the ability for folks to get mortgages. And this is the biggest single period drop since this has been tracked. Uh, it's not, credit is not as tight as it was say in 2011 and 12, immediately following the um, credit, uh, the financial crisis. And I, trust me, I know I bought a house in 2013 and they needed a blood test and all kinds of stuff in order for you to qualify for one of these. Uh, credit had uh, loosened up quite a bit over the years, but this is just for that last period in March. And I expect that once this April is factored in, uh, it's going to drop even further, which that has a long-term ripple effect on housing prices uh, going forward. If fewer people are able to get loans, then you got fewer people in the market for buying a new home, which impacts housing prices uh, down the road and for the foreseeable future. So it's, it's not looking terribly optimistic for the, the value of homes or housing prices in the, in, the next, in the next quarter or the next few months. So then the next slide shows you know, the fallout from these uh, financial institutions. Earnings were, were reported this last week, I believe on Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, for a lot of these and, and earnings were uh, down considerably uh, off of a year ago. And uh, part of that also is that these financial institutions are taking measures to in anticipation of bad debt, okay? Goldman Sachs is setting aside $20 billion to for bad debt, for defaulted mortgages, for defaults on credit. Uh, Bank of America has set aside an almost $5 billion for bad debt, credit cards that don't get paid back, things like that. City is set, they have a little bit more credit cards than B of A. They're setting aside $7 billion. City is a big issuer of credit cards and their big concern is that credit cards are not going to be, or credit payments are not going to be made and there may be some default on credit cards. Now this is, these are things that are going to happen down the road. So right now what's going on obviously is we're worried about unemployment and incomes and people being able to pay rent these being able to make these credit payments and things uh, that's going to hit these institutions hard probably in the coming weeks. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about just real quick is you guys have probably heard about this direct payments to farmers and there isn't a lot of detail on it. Uh, it's been said that some detail may come out today. Uh, if it does, you know, I, I encourage you to go in and look for it, but uh, we don't have the details right now. What we do know is what the sec what Secretary Purdue has said and what's been in print, and that's $16 billion, and they want this $16 billion to be in the form of direct payments to farmers, ranchers, you know, folks raising specialty crops, commodities, livestock, the whole the whole thing that's been impacted by this, including two to three billion in milk and other protein purchases. We've all seen the stories now this week, probably of milk being dumped. Uh, they want to send that to food banks or, you know, pork or beef that's uh, in excess, uh, send that to food banks. And then specific mention to cattle and pork and specialty crops uh, in these commodities hurt by the COVID-19 crisis we're dealing with right now. Again, that plans to be submitted. It's, I've heard that maybe it was already submitted, uh, but again, the details coming out of it, have we haven't seen them yet. And the other thing the secretary said on this is that this may not be the only uh, program to come out of this, that there might be a reevaluation uh, or there will be a reevaluation in the months to come to see if that $16 billion or in, and however it shakes out, if that's going to be enough to get our producers by uh, this, this year. Um, and, Part of that is the availability of funding and getting getting folks to agree on exactly what it's going to look like. So a little bit light on details. There is a program coming. Uh, as far as we know, I, I would expect that it's going to, to, to happen. Uh, what it's going to look like, exactly how many dollars per person or per animal or per acre, we, we don't know those details yet, but I believe the details of that will be coming in the next few days, if not uh, today. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next presenter. All right, let me get my video going here and we should be set. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Trey Nolson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, today I'm going to try and talk a little bit about uh, some questions I've been getting on, on marketing plans and how do we prepare for the future and, and in particular questions related to basis. Uh, so far, most of the market response, the negative market response we've seen has been at the futures market level. 
Um, we haven't seen a lot of changes yet in the basis levels, but I do want to talk about uh, what might be happening, what might be coming, some things to look for, um, and, and just give everybody a heads up. And because this can have an impact on structurally how you how you operate and how you uh, plan for the future and your marketing plans. So uh, without diving into gory detail, I just wanted to remind everybody about basis that mathematically it's the cash minus the futures market. So it's your local cash price minus the futures market price. It's that price differential. And again, we're really talking about two markets, the cash market at your local level, as well as the futures market then um, that is the public market. I want to, I really want to talk today more about the operational definition, which is the gold one on the bottom. Um, the way I like to try and explain it, basis is really your local market trying to regulate the flow of grain over time and space. So when, when is the grain need delivered and where does it need to be delivered to? So if we think about basis in that context, this, this presentation will make a lot more sense. On the next slide, I, I pulled some inf basis information. This would be local spot market basis. So this would be for grain delivered today. Um, these are the basis uh, levels offered. I picked one elevator kind of in East Central North Dakota. I won't tell you which one it is. It really doesn't matter. I'm just using this as a reference point. And I pulled that information to put together in, in a seasonal basis pattern. So we're looking from September 1, starting September 1, 2015, through yesterday. And I broke it down by crop marketing year. The highlighted red one is where we are today. So if we compare today's corn basis level for this particular elevator relative to the basis levels we've seen in the past, we're kind of right in the middle of the range. So seasonally, we're at a very typical basis, corn basis level today for spot market or old, old, mark, old crop corn. Now, one of the things, again, the basis level is trying to regulate the flow of grain. So it's the inflow of grain relative to the outflow of grain. So I just want to point to the purple line on the far right-hand side. If you notice, that would be 2016-17. Um, as we got into the summer months, summer and early fall of 2016-17, as the basis falls, what that signals is that the inflow of grain is coming faster than the outflow of grain. So the local market is trying to reduce, re reduce that supply flow and trying to regulate what's going on. In vice versa, for 2018-19, which is the blue line, we had a pop or kind of a spike in mid to late July. And what that really shows is that the inflow relative to the outflow was too slow. So again, the local market trying to raise the local basis level to get a bit more grain to flow into the system. On the next slide, what I tried to do is provide a, an overview of where does our grain go? And we don't have a really good read on that. I mean, it's not perfect, but the closest thing we have is a report by the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute. They do a survey of, of elevators across the state and say, where did you ship your grain? And every year they put together these, these summary reports. I just pulled the one from 2018-19 as a reference point. So this would be where does the grain, where is the outbound flow of grain? When, a grain, when the elevator buys it, where do they ship it to? Um, and you can see based on last year's numbers, about 57% of our corn went into the PNW, at least the corn that went through the elevator system. About 13% was transferred internally, which is that blue, that dark blue slice. Um, about 13% was transferred internally in, within the state. Now, most of that is going to flow either to an ethanol plant or to the corn sweetener plant then on Wapaton. Now, this does not track farmer, direct farmer deliveries into the ethanol system or into the corn sweetener plant. So this would be just elevator deliveries or re-deliveries. So if we think about all of our grain supply, all of our corn supply in North Dakota, you know, rough estimate, I'd say you maybe about half, about 50% of our corn gets on a train and leaves the, leaves the state um, to the PNW. The other half is either used locally or stays domestic within the U.S. marketplace. So when we think about the impact of COVID-19 or the coronavirus on, on grain movements and, and who's buying grain, our product here, or at least our corn in North Dakota, is a bit more sensitive to what happens in the international market versus like the, the national average, because on nationally, we, we export about 15% of our corn in this region is closer to 50% hits one of the export terminals. Um, so our, our prices are, are, are a little bit more equally balanced. So when we think about what would happen to our local supplies, the two big issues we need to think about for outbound flow of grain and, and thus impacting local basis levels would be 
the shipments out to PNW or our export pace into the Asian markets for corn. And the second would be the local demand base for ethanol and the corn sweetener plant. And I know there's some concerns now, and David uh, Ripplinger will talk about this a little bit more um, about the, you know, the longevity or at least the concerns, short-term concerns about profitability and operation um, of some of the ethanol plants nationally. I do know that um, Hankinson Renewable has stopped receiving grain. Um, so they're, they're still, as my understanding is they're still manufacturing, but they're not receiving any new grain. Um, my, also my understanding, I haven't had a chance to talk to a lot of folks, is that the other ethanol plants are receiving grain, uh, but they're trying to fulfill the contracts that are already in place. And so they're obviously slowing production, trying to manage their inventories. So as we think forward, as we look forward in time, Again, for corn basis levels, might, might impact your local corn basis level. Number one would be export pace, in particular into the Asian markets. And then the second, of course, would be the profitability and, and the, the um, purchasing by the local ethanol plants. On the next slide, I did the same thing for uh, soybean basis levels. And again, the red bar is the current uh, marketing year. Um, you can see same thing in the green line in 2017, 18 on the far right hand side. That was when the, um, the um, trade war started kicking in and China uh, basically stopped their purchases of US soybeans. Obviously the outflow was zero and therefore the basis had, the inflow really needed to be zero as well. So the basis was, was pushed much, much lower to try and prevent or, or restrict the inflow of grain. Um, if you look at the gold, gold bar on the far right hand side of that darker brown one, 2015-16, we had the opposite happen. As we got into harvest or closer to the harvest pressure, the outflow of grain became larger than the inflow. And so again, then basis levels were started to increase. If we compare today's soybean basis levels with the last four years, at least for this time period, we're you know, about typical, maybe even a little bit stronger than normal. And I think some of that is because we have seen some shipment of soybeans out to the PNW. So on the next slide, how do we use up or where does the grain in, where do the soybeans in, the United, in North Dakota go? Um, now again, this is 2018-19 level. So our total soybean um, outflow from the state was much lower than it has been historically, but that proportion, the percentage of where we sent it really didn't change much. And typically, we send approximately 70% of our soybeans out to the PNW. Um, last year, 2018-19, was closer to 63%. We do use or have some transshipments a little bit internally. Um, I know the Enderlin plant does process some soybeans. Again, this does not re reflect the direct farmer delivery to, to a processing plant. So when we look at this and, and we look at soybean, we're much more dependent upon the export market, which is not a surprise. About you know a, a, a third, maybe a little bit more than a third of our soybeans stay within the U.S. Um, so when we're looking at the profitability of the of the domestic crushing industry, um, that's important to the overall futures market of soybeans, but not necessarily have a huge impact on your local basis levels. It's going to be much more tied to or linked to export sales and export deliveries. The next slide, uh, I did the same thing for hard red spring wheat. Again, you can see the real seasonal pattern we have in basis levels for spring wheat in today's world. Um, actually, when you look at today's spring wheat basis levels relative to what we've seen the last four years, they're, they're a little bit stronger than we typically see. But again, it's following that same basic basis pattern. And so as, as we move into the harvest time period, traditionally we have either flat or slightly decreasing basis levels as we get close to harvest, again, as farmers start cleaning their bins out, getting ready for the fall season. On the next slide, we, it's again the same thing. Where do the elevators ship the grain that they have purchased? Um, about 35% goes to the PNW, or about 75% stays domestic within the United States. Uh, please notice that, that, again, that dark blue sliver uh, for North Dakota at 6%, um, that would primarily be the state mill and elevator in Grand Forks. And of course, they also do some direct farmer receiving. So when we look at all of the wheat within the region, um, it's going to be a little bit higher for domestic usage. So let's say roughly um, two thirds of our, of our wheat stays in the domestic market, about one third is exported from this region, again, primarily the PNW. So what happens domestically 
with wheat consumption will have a slightly larger impact on your basis levels than what happens internationally. Now, both of them are going to be important. I don't want to downplay that, but it is, it is something that we need to be watching. So again, as we turn to the COVID-19 issues, uh, we need to be concerned about supply chain disruptions, whether it be through the railroad system or through local processing. Um, my expectation is that as we move into fall, as long as we can keep the supply chains full, that, that I don't expect the local basis levels for corn, soybeans, and wheat to be that different from typical seasonal patterns. So what I'm suggesting is, um, again, unless there's something we don't expect on the ethanol side, um, most of the price increase we're going to see, if there is one later on, is going to come from the futures market, and it'll be a futures market play. So that may have an impact on what marketing tools you use and the structure you have moving forward. So with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Life Marketing Economist. We go to my first slide here. I just want to follow up on some of the things that Brian mentioned. I know there's a lot of interest in how much for livestock producers of how much money am I going to get and the wants are very high. And so what I've done here is uh, I'm not uh, showing favoritism or anything to any particular commodity group, but I just have some different commodity groups and what their uh, losses that they have submitted to USDA are. And, uh, and, you know, the bottom line is that their losses are way, way more. Brian mentioned the $16 billion, but originally nine. 9.5 was to go to livestock and, and produce and direct marketing people. And now some has been added. And I think the addition is going to be, like you said, for buying commodities, buying pork and, and milk and so on. But anyway, starting off the NCBA estimate for the cattle industry, 13.6 billion. The national pork producers estimated 5 billion. Again, I'm not selecting any particular group here. There are a lot of state organizations and other national organizations that have sent their information to USDA too, and some of them are higher on the cattle and hog side as well, up 15 billion for cattle and all kinds of different ones. And these are just to show you some amounts that add up to way more than the, even the 16 that recently came out, the American Sheep Industry Association says over 300 million, uh, you know, the dairy industry, maybe 5.7 billion. Again, their estimates higher and lower in this, the fresh produce, 5 billion. The National Chicken Council did not submit an actual number, but estimates have been flowing around uh, 4 billion. So if you add all those up, it's $34 billion. And, you know, at the most, we're going to have 16 and spread across a lot of things. So, um, are, you know, the question I keep getting is, are there going to be others? And Brian mentioned this, there may well be. And, and Ron is going to talk about some programs running out of money, and they're trying to get more into that. So there are absolutely a lot of wishes here. And so don't just because your commodity group submitted something, think that I'm going to get that much. I also getting some uh, questions on the seafood is seafood a livestock and so at the bottom I've just uh, addressed that the uh, the the act the, the, the appropriation of money actually had 300 million for the seafood industry over and above or different from that 9.5 and I'm not sure if now that's in the 16 billion or not but again their losses at 1.5 billion but the seafood industry already had a, a 300 allocation. So we go to the next slide. Um, a lot of talk now about slaughter plants closing and so on, and there's a lot of a list there and things happening, and I'm not going to go through all those today unless there's a specific question, but you've heard in my report before in these that we've had uh, record uh, meat production this year, record beef, record pork, record chicken production and record total meat production. And uh, so we were going gangbusters on uh, slaughter and slaughter capacity here at the beginning of the year. That blue line is what we're doing this year. And then obviously, uh, well, the good news is right prior to the pandemic, we were you know, killing record amounts of hogs and, and, and high amounts of of cattle and chickens as well. So we were running them through the system, but with all the packing plant closures and slowdowns and stopping for cleaning and so on, you see the last couple of weeks that 
cattle, hog, and and broiler slaughter, and it has fallen dramatically. Sheep and lamb uh, also, and uh, some other issues going on there that we uh, just don't have time to talk about today. And so that's a concern because we've got more numbers ready out there than now are getting slaughtered in the last week or so. And so that's going to back up livestock. And particularly on a regional basis, it can be quite devastating. Just take the hog example there. The uh, Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls is a major market for hog producers in this area. 19, almost 20,000 head a day and they're closed down indefinitely. And so uh, there are hog producers in our area that cannot sell hogs now. The, you know, the other packing plants, like I said, because of all that's available are operating at full capacity. And so there are hogs trying to find a, a slaughter plant that can't in this area and that's uh, devastating and hurts prices and, and gonna back up. And so that's causing just uh, all kinds of problems and likely to continue because more reports come in. If we go to my next slide, uh, all kinds of questions is why are, you know, sometimes supermarkets bear on some uh, meat products when we've got record production and all this and other things. And, and I've mentioned this before, but you know, the meat that is packaged at the wholesale level to go into the restaurant trade is a whole different ball game than what goes to the retail store. And just start off on the left-hand side there. When restaurants buy bacon, they buy these 24 pound packs of bacon and open them up and put them on you know, their breakfast or put it on hamburgers or chicken burgers or whatever it might be, but these are big packs. Now when people go into a retail store, they wanna buy one pound pack. So in order to change that over from the meat that would, you know, restaurants are closed down, that mean you have to do 24 packs when it used to be one, we don't have the packaging material and it's kind of tough. And uh, a lot of people do not want to go into a retail store, even if you diverted that 24 pound thing and, and buy it. So that's one of the problems. That middle slide, I know you, and, and you know, necessity is, is the mother of invention. And so there's all kinds of th things going on now at the wholesale sector, trying to get that moved over that would have went to uh, restaurants into a, more of a retail channel. The middle slide there is, is difficult to see, it's kind of blurry, but uh, this is just a, a, um, a, a chicken plant down in North Carolina where they have a lot of chicken plants, obviously, and they are packaging 10 pound bags of chicken breast to go into the restaurant store. And again, usually consumers don't want to go into the store and, and buy uh, that quantity, but they just opened up in their parking lot for anybody that wanted to come through and had a $10 bill. It says right on there, don't get out of your car, or pick up, drive in. We'll give you a 10 pound pack of chicken breasts uh, for $10. So that's a dollar a pound, come in and, and get it. So there's a diversion of the wholesale uh, that would usually go to the restaurant into a retail. Another kind of interesting one on the right there uh, is uh, briskets. You know, briskets are sold in family servings typically and is kind of a hot item now. In fact, uh, you know, I have three daughters and their husbands and families that live in town here and they all decided they wanted smoked brisket for Easter and, and uh, asked dad if he would foot the bill, which I said I would. And so we all had uh, briskets, but bought them and you know, in, in you know, four small briskets. But the, uh, a friend of mine in Denver sent me this is a brisket that would typically go wholesale into re the barbecue restaurants. It would buy a 16 pound brisket, and and um, then uh, you know, they've got the, the bigger smokers and so on, and and for all the restaurant have uh, have that demand. But this is a Costco store in Denver. And so they just purchased a bunch of those briskets that would have went into the retail or into the uh, restaurant sector, put it in the retail store. Here it is, 16 pounds, buy it. And, and uh, you know, are getting some takers. So again, all kinds of things going on here, trying to move approximately half the meat that would have went into the restaurant and so on, trade back in onto the retail site. So if you go to my next slide, is uh, one that I've been showing you every time, so I'm not giving up on it now. It's just the 750 to 8 weight cattle uh, sold in North Dakota. And, you know, you have to check with your local auction markets, but there's still auction markets going, and there still is demand for 
feeder cattle, I, you know, last week I talked to you about the, this is the chart I showed you on the left there. And, uh, and uh, the red line then is what they've done this year. And again, we knew they ratcheted down, but last week they came up some and then those square boxes are the futures market. If we go out to the right hand side, then is the one for this week. Uh, uh, we did add about on the average again, and this is the time of year when we start selling less and less feeder cattle because we worked through last year's calf crop and you know, particularly get into May and so on and after calving, but we still are merchandising cattle and the market was up about $4. So there's still demand for cattle out there. And uh, on the futures market side, you see the futures look very much similar. These, this is the April and May futures, and then the August, uh, September, October look very similar to last week. And so we didn't have the big volatile meeting, or the big volatile movement in the futures that we've had there for several weeks. We talked about the $10 range from day to day and so on. You know, we ended up uh, Thursday's close to Thursday close on the, for instance, on the September future up about a dollar, but the May future down maybe 40 cents or something, but it's really benign. And that's good news that have that futures market settle down and not be so wild. So go to my last slide. These are just the two North Dakota market reports, again, on the left side uh, for last week and then on the right side for this week. And to show you that the, in general, prices for feeder cattle, and you can, you, I'm not gonna go th all, all through these. I just kind of highlighted the 550 to sixes on the top and the seven to eight weights that I just got through talking about the bottom that did increase about $4. So cattle are moving. There's a good uh, demand for the lightweight cattle to go on grass yet because there's good moisture all the way up from Oklahoma up through here. And so cattle are still being merchandised. And with that, then I'll turn it over to David to discuss some of the bioenergy stuff. I guess, I guess I'm next, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was gonna talk about the payroll protection program. So if you look at my first slide here, um, the PPP was part of the CARES Act uh, and it was the intent was to keep it uh, to keep people employed, and uh, it, it they allocated 349 billion dollars, and uh, that's all used up right now. So last, I guess Congress is in is in recess, but I guess they must have gotten together for a little time last week, and they were discussing to, uh, replenishing that for 250 billion more, but that didn't go anywhere at this time. Most experts think that Congress will replenish this program, and uh, because there's still a lot of people that didn't get that didn't get their money, they're in the queue. They have applied and haven't gotten any money at this point. During the during the 14 day period that they were giving out these loans, they gave out 1.66 million loans by almost 5,000 lenders. Just quite amazing. The loan applications were very very simple. It didn't take much to, uh, to apply for a loan, so they, they pushed them through. According to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, they, they gave out, typically, they gave, uh, uh, this is around 14 years of loans uh, in 14 days. So uh, we've been getting uh, different guidance and the rules change every day on this program. Uh, we did get uh, some, some guidance now called the interim final rule which doesn't seem very final to me. So uh, that, uh, that kind of means we're still gonna get some more changes as we go along. But we did get some guidance on farmers and self-employed individuals. Now normally farmers aren't eligible for SBA loans, but the act specifically says businesses qualify including agricultural enterprises. The next slide, I'm gonna talk about the eligibility of the program. You must have been uh, in, in operation uh, on February 15th. Uh, that's one of the criteria. Now, as I go through these, these rules, I'm assuming that this program will be replenished. And, uh, and so we can follow these rules forward now. Um, small businesses with fewer than 500 employees qualify. Five, 501c3s, which are nonprofits, qualify. They have to have less than 500 employees. 
And, indiv and the individual uh, 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 who operates as a sole proprietor, which probably most farmers are, uh, an individual who operates as an independent con contractor, they're also, uh, they're also eligible. And we did get more guidance, as I mentioned, on, on people who were, who were self-employed, which most farmers are. There is a few other definitions. I won't get, get into all that, but the, this is the basics of the eligibility. Next, I'm going to get into some of the details. Uh, the authorization for this was through, uh, through the banks, and, and there is banks that are uh, affiliated with SBA loans, and even other banks were authorized to give out these loans. Um, also, the farm credit system was authorized. So that kind of tells you right there that farmers or agriculture is, is, uh, elig are, are eligible for this. Uh, when you fill out an application, there's one thing to check, and that says, uh, is your business, does it have current economic uncertainty? Well, of course it does. I think every business has current economic uncertainty at this point, okay? But, uh, it, but this program, I think the spirit of the program was made to keep people working and to keep people get, getting paid. So there's probably people getting these loans that probably could get by without them. And there's some people that really need the loans that probably got shortchanged here. That's just my speculation. We'll see how it all works out when, we, when it all, when it all uh, gets over with. But the maximum amount now that you can get for your loan is your normal payroll cost uh, times 2.5. Um, you can't get more than 10 million. And if you have an employee that makes over 100,000, you've got to cap it at that. Now, how do you define payroll costs? Well, it's the salary and most of the benefits that go along with that salary are considered payroll costs. The terms of the loan, they, they finally uh, agreed on that. It's a two-year loan, 1% interest. It is a government guarantee. You do not, you do not need any collateral. And the, the fees are waived. I, I'm assuming that the banks will get reimbursed for those fees. Now the banks now that are loaning this money, they're loaning them, uh, uh, they need to keep, they need to be aware of their uh, reserve requirements as they're giving these loans as well. Even though they are a government guarantee, if they get defaulted, the bank is still safe. So that's something to consider on the bank end of things. The allowable uses for this loan are payroll, healthcare benefits, as I mentioned, and mortgage interest. But that, that, that does not include principal, only the interest, also rents and utilities, and also interest on debts that you acquired before February 15th. February 15th seems to be that magic date. Okay, now we finally got guidance here on self-employed. Now in the treasury regulations, it talks about schedule C, which is the business schedule. It doesn't say anything about schedule F farm schedule. But most of the experts, most of the attorneys, people that deal with this have just kind of uh, interpreted that to include Schedule F as well, so I will, I will as well. Um, so how does a self-employed uh, person, let's say you're self-employed and have no employees, how, how do you determine what your payroll is? Well, they're just saying that your net profit from your business from the Schedule C or F is your pay. Of course, you still are, uh, you're still are, uh, uh, subject to that $100,000 limit. They came up with this new term called the owner compensation replacement. So in lieu of a, 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 a typical uh, a farmer would not necessarily give themselves a paycheck pay, pay, uh, unless they're part of a partnership or something like that. But if you're a self-employed um, sole proprietor, you, you, uh, you, this is the way of determining what you're wages would be. Next slide. It, 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 when you get this loan, um, there is a, an option to have forgiveness on the loan, as people, most people know by now. Um, you must spend this loan within an eight week period after you get the loan. And in order to be, for, uh, the order for, for forgiveness of the loan, 75% of that must have been used for payroll. 
So if you used most of your loan for utilities or rent, and you didn't necessarily use it all for payroll, I imagine that then the, the, the uh, forgiveness is prorated accordingly to the payroll. Um, also, if you had laid off people from, the, uh, and so you have less employees, your forgiveness is prorated as well. If you had laid off people and you do rehire them by June 30th, then you are not penalized on your forgiveness part. Now the question is on these self-employed uh, people, such as farmers, uh, the owner compensation replacement, how do you determine uh, what, what this, uh, for forgiveness purposes? So basically you take your profit from your Schedule F or Schedule C, and it's eight weeks divided by 52. It's just a fraction there, and that's, what you, that's how you determine that. And one thing that was specifically stated was that the, these loans that you get, uh, and if they are forgiven, are not taxable. Typically, IRS rule says if you have rule, uh, uh, loans that are, are forgiven, you, they, are, they need to be re recorded as income. But for purposes, purposes of the PPP program, they are not. Lastly, I have a few takeaway points. Um, you, need, you need justification uh, for this. I mean, so almost any, any business can apply for this the way it looks. The justification is that you've been hurt by, by this problem that we're having. Um, but I imagine that some so-called bigger small businesses have some high-priced attorneys that uh, really got on this and got their application in uh, right away and because uh, it's first come, first serve. And you may have some mom and pop businesses that maybe they're their own accountant and uh, they probably didn't get their, their, their application in or they're waiting in the queue. And so I think there may be, there might be some abuse of, of this program, but we'll, we'll see when they're, and I doubt that you can audit all these loans. So there probably be, will be some unintended consequences. Uh, the, the main thing to remember is to communicate with your lender. The lender is the, is the expert on this because they've done a lot of these loans. And also uh, I've hear, hearing from a lot of people document everything you do uh, it's actually recommended that you keep a separate account uh, and just show what you're paying this loan, what, you're, what expenses you are paying. Um, one thing to remember, if you apply for a loan, it's not a guarantee you're just going to get some low interest loan. And if you get the loan, it's not a guarantee that you will get it forgiven as well. And the last point I wanted to bring up was that if you do have, uh, present false statements on this federal loan, you're in big trouble. Um, it's a up to a $250,000 fine and five years in prison. So be aware of that as well. So those are the things I have for you at this, is this point, and we'll move on to, to uh, David. Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy Economic Specialist with NDCU Extension. Uh, just giving a quick overview of what's going on uh, on the energy side of things, uh, ethanol specifically. Uh, this last week and a half, we've seen a continued decline in production, and, and basically we've seen about a 20% reduction uh, each of the last four weeks. Uh, the last I heard, at the, at the minimum, we have at least refineries that are closed, you know, not operating, um, and at least 80 that are running at less than 50% capacity, similar to that hot idle that Frank had mentioned earlier, uh, accepting corn, uh, grinding that corn, but not, uh, not any more than that. Uh, and again, if you keep in mind that there's a little over 200 corn ethanol refineries uh, in the country, you have you know more than half that are that are closed or or running uh, at a very low rate. Uh, the good news is that we are uh, nearing equilibrium in terms of production and, and weekly use. Uh, of course, the the trade on that is that we've seen this this dramatic decline in production. Uh, we've also seen that margins are improving, but for the most part, negative for all corn ethanol refineries. Uh, corn prices have fallen, uh, ethanol prices have risen in the last week, uh, which makes things better, uh, but still negative. Uh, and, and for the most part, barely covering uh, variable costs uh, and, and not uh, anything beyond that. Uh, on the oil side, we're, we're seeing things move sl more slowly, uh, as been the case for the last few weeks, move more slowly in terms of, of reducing production. Uh, wells are beginning to be shut in. We heard some news here in North Dakota about you know thousands of wells being shut in in the last few weeks. Uh, there's also discussion in Texas, especially the smaller refineries. Excuse me, the fall the, the smaller 
uh, oil companies uh, shutting in their wells. And, and there was a meeting earlier this week, uh, Texas Rail Commission was going to decide uh, if they were going to actually enforce or, 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 or set rules regarding uh, a production decline, a mandated production decline. And then finally, probably the, the biggest uh, issue on the horizon is a storage crisis uh, that's really uh, coming to a head uh, where we just basically will not have enough working room for, for oil primarily, but also for uh, refined products uh, to, to actually uh, have the system operate. Uh, so just looking at oil production, just so you know, uh, we have about 16 and a half billion gallons of, of capacity here in the United States. We go back four weeks ago, uh, and you know we were at uh, about 95% use, capacity utilization, 15 and a half billion gallons, give or take. Again, that declined by about 20% within the week uh, through the 27th, declined again through the third. And now this, and these, these numbers are week old. Uh, so these, this was uh, production with the week through uh, April 10th, again, a week ago, but we'd actually declined, uh, uh, reduced production by almost half here in the United States. Again, with that, that, that overall capacity of 16 and a half billion gallons, now down to about uh, 8.7 billion gallons on an annualized rate. Uh, you know, and thinking about that, that's obviously half as much corn being used, half as many dis distillers being produced in addition to the ethanol. Uh, another way to, 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 to kind of illustrate what's going on is, is measuring uh, stocks in use in terms of days in storage. So if we go back to uh, March 20th, we see that for crude, gasoline, and ethanol in the United States, we have uh, about 25 uh, days in storage for each of those. And then in the last uh, few weeks, uh, it, it's dramatically increased. And now we're up to you know 54 days of storage for ethanol, which is a dramatic uh, increase and again that hits both the the numerator and denominator. We're using less and stocks are building rapidly. Uh, so ethanol is definitely seeing the largest uh, increase, followed by gasoline and crude, just a, a, a slight uptick. And um, have the four-year averages there. Well, again, typically you know somewhere in the mid twenties is, is what we what we've seen for 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 days in storage. So we're clearly at the high end at record levels, especially for ethanol. Uh, talking about the the upcoming storage crisis, just looking at oil storage here in the United States, uh, it's important to recognize that you know we have a, you know a large system of pipelines and uh, infrastructure to to transport oil, to store oil, to refine it, and then to deal with those refinery products. If we look at the U.S. in in total, we you know we actually have a lot of working storage available. Uh, the, the the darker blue uh, part of it. That cylinder is is where we were on the 13th, uh, and just a slight increase, uh, you know, ac across the United States uh, through last Friday. Uh, and this week is actually the first time DOE has reported uh, stocks uh, in, in this way, knowing that this is an important issue. Uh, but if we look more uh, at a specific region, especially Cushing, so that's where WTI is priced, the West, West Texas Intermediate, the benchmark oil. Uh, you, you see how in certain locations that, that these stocks are, are increasing dramatically. So if we go back to the 13th, uh, they were about half full in terms of, of what they actually had. Uh, and then in the last few weeks, it basically increased uh, the amount in storage in that, that region, that relatively small region by 20% and getting us you know, much closer to that, that, that working storage limit. And it's important in kind of analogy for this, as you think about if you're, if you're working in the kitchen, you know, you, you, you need counter space to move stuff around and to get things done. And so it's not when you reach the maximum when you're done, it, it's sooner than that, you know, because you cannot, you know, physically move uh, these quantities around. Uh, and again, just looking at those, those changes going from about half full in Cushing uh, in, in mid-March to 70% full today, uh, really, uh, really quick fill up. And again, the expectation is unless things change dramatically uh, by Memorial Day, there'll be uh, inadequate working space. And then, uh, you know, all bets are off. I've mentioned before in the last few weeks that it's completely plausible, expected that we will see negative prices for certain types of oil in certain regions uh, as, as folks simply just don't have the space to, to, to deal with it. Uh, and, and again, this kind of leads back to that, that idea of shutting in wells, which we've started to see a lot of here in North Dakota. Uh, last thing, and this kind of segues to some of the other discussions we've had regarding what are the, the, 
the longer term implications or what are the expectations for the recovery of the economy. And there's been a lot of, a lot of conversations about what the expectations are from DOE, uh, International Energy uh, Association, regarding what this dip is going to look like. And all of them, for the most part, think it's going to be a straight up V. So we're going to see a, that there was a slight decline in the first quarter, a big decline in quarter two, and then by the end of the year, we'll basically be back to where we were. Uh, you know, these numbers came out from, from USDOE a few weeks ago, and I think I'd expect that most people think that this this is not what's going to happen. And again, Brian mentioned this a little bit or alluded to this a little bit, is we have those those broader economic issues that as people don't work, as the economy doesn't pick up, as people don't need to travel, uh, it'll feed upon itself. You know, basically what what uh, USDOE and and other folks are expected or stated is that we'd stop for a couple months and then just get right back into our vehicles and go get right back into our trucks and move freight. And you know that's, that's likely not gonna be the case. And in fact, if you look at, and it's not these numbers, but uh, the IEA's numbers, they actually have uh, production above consumption. That is that we'd have, uh, and again, you see that, you know, you'd, have, you'd have use above uh, production even here you know, later this year again, that we would start drawing down those stocks. And I, I'm not sure that that's plausible. Uh, so that that's uh, led us to the end of our, our presentations. And now I'll be happy to field some questions. I'll go ahead and read the questions and direct them. Uh, and then if the, the panelists want to respond, that would be great. Uh, the first one I see uh, is, a, is a great question. So can the PPP borrower who used funds for payroll still deduct those payroll costs for tax purposes? And so Ron, I don't know if you have an answer for that one. Yes, uh, if there's, we're still waiting for guidance on that. But for the last uh, uh, things that I found out was that if you just have it as a loan and it's not forgiven, then you can deduct. But if you get the loan forgiven, then you cannot deduct. But we're still waiting for the rule on that. Great, thanks, Ron. And then, then I'll just read this. Uh, and it's just it's just a point. Uh, so SBA came out with clarification that line 34 of Schedule F on the tax return. So that $100,000 cap, you generate a $20,000 loan uh, times two and a half will get you that. So there's the math there. And that eight over 52 applies during the forgiveness period, but not in loan determination. Um, I, I can address that. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I made, a, I made a, a little mistake on my slide there that owner, owner compensation replacement was for the forgiveness only. The, the, uh, the, uh, the profit of Schedule F divided by 12 times 2.5, that's your loan amount. That's correct. Uh, I guess Jacob uh, sent that in. And, um, and, the, and the 852 rule applies for the forgiveness. Right. Great. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Jacob. Are, are there any other questions from the group? Uh, feel free to use the chat to, to ask your question and I'll, I'll direct them. And, and since there's, there's nothing standing, I'll, I'll just give you a few minutes. Uh, and as we're kind of coming to the end here, I'll just reiterate, we do have some, some quick questions for you, uh, some feedback for this uh, at the URL that's, that's on the screen. I really appreciate that type of feedback. It, it helps guide us uh, at extension and to make sure that we're delivering what we can to do an even better job in the future. Uh, and then as we've mentioned a few times, you know, we, this, this uh, webinar has been recorded as have the previous ones. Uh, and you can go and check those out. Uh, Scott mentioned he'd have it posted relatively soon. Yeah, so a question about distiller's grains. Uh, will you be able to get distiller's grains? Well, it, prices have increased tremendously. Uh, right now, it's about $200 a ton uh, for distiller's grains here in the upper Midwest, which is uh, you know, a, a dramatic increase over, over the recent period. Uh, I don't know how much, prices, how much higher prices will go. Um, but clearly they're trying to, to ration off this, you know, the distillers grains found a nice, nice place in the ration uh, and folks that were expecting it and now it's simply not available. I, I really don't have strong expectations other than they are high. And from the ethanol refineries uh, perspective in, in this week uh, for, for that South Dakota ethanol plant, according to USDA, distillers grains are the primary source of income. So they're the, they're the product and ethanol is the co-product. And I, and I guess we'll just see how that goes. Again, the, the, 
the good news or the, the silver lining on the corn ethanol side is that they're close to equilibrium. And so even though distillers production has fallen by about half, you know, in, in that same ratio as, as the corn crush has, uh, you know, th things are kind, kind of leveling out. So I guess we'll see, you know, exactly how that works out. Um, but of course there, there has been a reduction. Some producers will not get distillers when they, they, they did previously unless they're ready, willing to bid up. And the prices are, are about as high as they've ever been. Uh, another question, how are operating loans going for growers this spring? So I don't know if there's any of the panelists have any comments on that. And then any changes in land rents? Uh, as far as the changes in land rents goes, um, so far I haven't heard anything. You know, a lot of that, uh, what was going to be paid headed into the 2020 growing season is negotiated and agreed upon well in advance of uh, what happened with uh, coronavirus and, uh, and you know, commodity prices falling rather dramatically. I mean, all this stuff has really happened in about five weeks. So it, as you guys know, uh, land rents are negotiated, agreed upon, and often paid well before March uh, and, and factored into any operating loans. So this having an impact on 2020's rents was was unlikely now going forward into 2021 you know it's going to depend we, we would have thought that maybe there would have been a reduction in rents before but because of ad hoc programs like mfp and and uh, the farm programs that that already existed like arc and plc there's been uh, a lot of government assistance in that regard as far as the operating loans um, goes. I have not in the in the folks that I've talked to heard that there's been any, been any hiccup in terms of operating lines due directly to coronavirus. Uh, that the you know the the ad. now one thing I'll say about that though is very few uh, community banks uh, or even mid-sized ag banks. You know, I'm, for in, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm originally from Nebraska. A mid-sized one might be or a larger one like Pinnacle. Very few of them have an ag-only portfolio, almost none. Uh, the main ones that would be, that, that have ag only might be like a land bank or a farm credit services, but even then they may have some other sectors. And so what's going to uh, possibly, what we have to think about with uh, the effects on the banks going forward might be what happens on their commercial lending side as well. You know, it's been that commercial lending has been, not commercial, but uh, uh, commercial and, uh, you know, individual. Uh, personal loans. Um, those have been strong for the last several years. The macro economy has been doing well, low unemployment, uh, high rates of uh, uh, payback and uh, low rates of default or distress. And so what we're going to have to kind of monitor going forward is how that portfolio of our ag banks uh, winds up affecting them because it, over the years, they've had to take on a much larger personal banking and commercial banking portfolio to support their ag lending program. Um, and so what's what's gone on with the high unemployment and folks um, concerned about the future, that may that may spill in uh, to ag lending a little bit, depending on how, how strong their balance, uh, the bank's balance sheets are. So that's, that's something to look at going forward. But so far, I haven't heard anything about um, um, operating loans or being held up specifically because of the the COVID-19 virus going on right now, um, unless Frayne has something he wants to add with that as well. Uh, no, Brian, the, I, I would have basically the same same comments that uh, the, the loan application process, and I think mo a lot of the loans have already been been taken care of. There's always a few that come in a little bit later, but um, my understanding is most of the, the ag loans are, the, the ag lenders are still following the procedures they had before. Um, they, they have been kind of using a standard um, uh, price forecast uh, for, their, the, for the loan applications. Again, the hope and the expect, well, the hope right now is that we'll see a, a rebound of prices by the time we get into harvest levels. We'll have to wait and see about that. But I, to my knowledge, it's not making a difference in the loan application process. Right. And, and just to address Jeff Stein's comment, you know, that's kind of kind of what we were seeing. I mean, heading into 2020 was a lot like when we headed into 2019. MFP helped us out a lot. Things uh, it kept us above water and, and kept the, the ball rolling downhill. So 
yeah, talk to us and, and head it into 2020 and 2021 and see what things look like. And again, re reiterating, we, we've put out some, I put out some reports not too long ago on cash rents and land values. And remember those kind of things are really backward looking. You guys are probably, we're all trying to think about what the, what the future holds. Uh, but a lot of the data we have is really backward looking and this came on so hard and so fast that it's right now hard to take stock of exactly what the impact is going to be when in a lot of cases we simply just do not have the data. I mean, we just, we don't have it. For instance, housing prices might be two or three months lagged before we really can figure out exactly how it's affected people's wealth and, and everything moving forward. So we're trying to adjust as best we can and come up with some strategies and, and just make folks mindful of what's coming. And that's why I reiterate going back to the, uh, uh, the beginning of my presentation here that this huge jump in unemployment in just four weeks is going to have ramifications many weeks and months down the road. I don't see a big steep V recovery uh, coming back in one of our older presentations. I showed some scenarios and kind of gave my outlook on it, but I, I truly believe a lot of these jobs are not coming back. Um, a lot of the jobs lost are just simply not coming back. And so how long that takes for those individuals to get back on their feet, what we, we just don't know. And, th and that's a big thing that leads into all the consumption questions that, uh, that you guys have and uh, that I myself actually have. Yeah, just going back, a comment was made by Marsha uh, regarding operating loan renewals. Uh, just saying it's a little bit different with lobbies closed. Uh, and a lot of new members looking to re refinance with with lower interest rates. Uh, and then there was another question regarding the impact of the, the storage crisis on the Bakken, uh, more or less impacted than other areas of, of production. Um, so we're, we're clearly seeing that. So, I mean, it's first communicated in price, and we've seen a rapid decline in uh, the price of North Dakota Light Suite over the last month, uh, and the spread between that and the WTI uh, growing a bit. Uh, the Bakken is going to experience it more so than many other regions because we're distant from a lot of refiners. Um, and we've already seen some response to that with the number of, sh uh, of well shut-ins. Uh, there was a change in policy uh, by the North Dakota Industrial Commission to allow wells to be shut in, but not, not have to be closed within a year, which used to be the, the old policy. You either have to bring them back online or, or permanently close them and, and the, the state changed their, their policy on that. A lot of discussion about how it's going to be managed. There's a lot of interest in quickly building uh, storage with in the region. Uh, but truth be told, there you just can't build enough fast enough. You know, we saw production decline more than, and this was from Lynn Helms. He gave his director's cut earlier this week. You know, productions declined. You know, 300,000 barrels. You know, about 20% in, in in a few short weeks but it's still one and a half million barrels. And you know, folks, folks are talking about, well, gosh, I could build store, you know, 200,000, maybe even 300,000 barrels of storage, which is a very good size tank. Uh, but that's not going to make up for the half of it. Um, and Marsh is saying, you know, this, the slowing in production and the layoffs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in a lot of cases, I mean, it came on, it came on pretty quick, you know, Whiting has, you know, declared bankruptcy. Uh, the rig count has declined. Uh, one of the th thoughts about rig count right now, it's about 30. I saw Baker Hughes had 35 for last week. And I, I, I saw, on, I'm pretty sure I saw on uh, the DMR's website that they were down to 31. The thought is, you know, it's going to go into the, the high twenties, which I think is probably a given or even to the high teens in terms of rig count. Uh, and that kind of remains to be seen. But right now, the economics are pretty tough. We did have uh, North Dakota Light Suite was under 10 bucks within the last couple of weeks. And that's, that's far below uh, covering your variable costs and making folks have to shut in. You know, one of the, just to step back, one of the nice things about North Dakota making that policy regarding not having to permanently close your well is it allows uh, the, the oil companies to make decisions based on economics. Uh, and, and the actual finances rather than making that strategic decision about possibly having to, to close it a year later. Uh, and, you know, that, that type of approach is, is much appreciated by the industry. And we're seeing similar things, uh, you know, across North America with, with, with those types of, uh, those types of rules. And it looks like we're kind of getting to any questions. One of the things I do is just bring it back to the panelists. Is there anything that you want to mention or things that you thought about while the others were speaking? 
Oh, Dave, you want to mention your Wednesday sem uh, webinars? Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, I, I don't have a, a link for it, but uh, uh, NDSU Extension is is working with uh, FSA to provide weekly webinars on some FSA programs. Uh, we had our first one last week on conservation programs. Uh, this week we're moving into to, to farm-based programs. If you want to learn more, you can go to the NDSU Extension website uh, or or just let me know. Um, but those are 11 o'clock uh, on Wednesday morning, and we, we do record those and post those. Uh, so there's one again this Wednesday and then the, the Wednesday following. I guess if I can jump in, this is Frain. Um, again, I want to encourage everybody to try and provide some feedback. Um, we're, we're, we're doing our best to try and, and provide information that we think is valuable. But obviously, if there are issues or things that, that you folks have, that you want us to talk about or topics that are of special interest, uh, feel free to please contact us individually if you want, or you can go to the to the feedback page and provide it there. Um, again, we we're we're trying to provide information that you find valuable, so um, please give us your feedback when possible. Are, th are there any last comments from any of the panelists? Uh, if not, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and. Uh, you're very welcome to provide feedback via the link or to look at this uh, recording of this and stay in tune with other uh, webinars, including the FSA webinar, uh, by going to the Farm Management uh, website. Thanks, everybody.